Um, you know what? Stop your equipment. I'm going to say something about Joseph. I want. All right, I've lost my board here. <clears throat> but on the chart, <laughs> back over there, uh, I don't know that we need it. Well, I guess go ahead and bring it. On the chart, and it's kind of hard to see because it is smaller, but we've been, uh, most of you know, we've been studying the tabernacle. And um, the, the forerunner to the temple that Israel had, and we've been studying the different parts of the tabernacle. And right now we're studying the table of showbread. And one of the reasons why we're doing it, because that's Old Testament, is because I personally believe that the things in this tabernacle represent things that are still important to God's heart. And in fact, those were just shadows. All of the things that were in that tabernacle were a shadow. And then the book of Hebrews teaches us that. They were shadows of good things to come, it says, and of things that, I mean, that may represent the Lord's view more than ours. This, this is good stuff to him, you know. We may not get it, but he gets it. And it's something that's precious to his heart. And so the reason why we're studying these kind of things is we're studying these things so that we may see the fulfillment of what they represent. And uh, last time I shared, was that just last week? Gosh, it seems so long ago for me. Man, it seems like a month. Anyway, um, we shared on the table of showbread, which when you enter into the tabernacle, you pass the altar and then the next in line is the laver. Uh, but then you go into the holy place, and on the left is the seven-branch candlestick, and on the right is the table of showbread. And right in front of the veil, wherein is the holy of holies and the presence of God, is the altar of incense. And uh, so last week we talked somewhat about the table of showbread. And the word showbread really does mean to show it to demonstrate it, to let it be seen and understood. And it was something that the priests uh, were constantly in the midst of their ministry and everything. They were involved with it. And when the Sabbath came, they, as it were, sat down with God and had communion over that bread. And so last week, we, we'd spent a lot of time in John chapter 6. And in John, and we're not going to go there right now, but in John chapter 6, we <clears throat> talked a lot about what Jesus spoke of himself, that he's the bread of life. And he talked about, you know, eating his flesh and drinking his blood and taking him in to us, not just believing in him as our Savior, but actually, uh, and not just getting saved by him coming in, but allowing his life and his nature to flow through us. And we're going to continue on that, but we're going to take a little bit different angle uh, tonight. I want to talk about the table of showbread, but I want to talk about it in relationship to communion. Um, so if you will, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Verse, we're going to look at verse 1 and 2. <clears throat> and I may end up, because I really do have a lot to share and since our sharing times are 20 minutes now, uh, I may end up reading my notes instead of preaching from my notes. Hebrews 9, verse 1 and 2. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So here we see that under the first covenant, <clears throat> here's the shadow. And it is it just outright mentions um, the table, and it says, and the table and the showbread, okay, um, which is called the sanctuary. And then also, just real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verse 21. And what we're going to see in this verse is he's talking about communion 
Um, and instead of reading the larger context right now, you can check that out later. But he's talking about communion, and he calls communion the Lord's table. The Lord's table being the fulfillment of the Lord's table, the table of showbread. This is 1 Corinthians 10, verse 21. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Okay, so just the point of that is primarily to point out that he's not afraid to call communion the Lord's table. All right, so in, if, if it's taken just simply <clears throat> Or religiously, communion is us sitting down and drinking of the cup and eating the bread and um, um, uh, the, you know, the, there's a significance behind all of that. And we know the words, but I think um, maybe we don't really fully have seen all of the concepts. And I've seen one fairly recently um, well, it's been a while, but that I'm that there's a possibility that maybe even some of you have never really heard it quite like this, maybe from quite the angle that I'll take, but we're going to cover some other things first. Um, so let me just try to read a little bit here so that uh, our time doesn't get away from us. Um, the significance of the Lord's Supper, and just as we said, going through those motions. In truth, it goes beyond this. Communion involves taking part with him as he is and not simply doing it in the manner the Lord would prescribe. In other words, not just doing the ritual or the symbolism, but doing this as he is and partaking of him as he is. And to do that requires absolutely that we know Jesus more than a savior, we know him as he is. And because you cannot partake of him as he is until you know him as he is. And one of the big problems within Christianity here or anywhere else is that <clears throat> we tend to know him as he's been taught to us by people or as we've read in books or, you know, as, as we've heard. But we want to know him by the spirit of God. Um, so... Our communion with Jesus relates specifically to the body, which is, which is the bread, and to the blood, which represents his life. In the same manner, his communion with us here is in and with our body and our life. In other words, we think communion is eating of symbols. Those are only symbols. But the true communion is with our body and with the life of Christ that we have taken in. The life is in the blood and taking that, not just believing in that, not just believing in those two things and saying, yes, that's deep spiritual stuff. It has no practical <laughs> application in my life. But no, it, it is Christ being taken into us and we functioning as his body. And we'll talk about that a little more as we go. And, and functioning by his life and not just by his standards. <clears throat> um, in the same manner, his communion with us here is in our, in our body and our life. Therefore, this goes far beyond the Lord just having some, someone accompany him in the ritual. It is not simply partaking with him, which we think, I wrote it like that because we think of communing with someone as two people fellowshipping and getting along. But this is completely different. It involves us partaking of him those elements representing him, actually. <clears throat> so if we, uh, if we only take the approach of learning the meaning of communion based upon its meaning to the disciples and early Christians, we may fall short. Now that sounds, that sounds strange. If we only get it from the disciples or the early Christians, it may fall short. And here's why I wrote it that way. For example... Paul's rebuke in 1 Corinthians to the disciples of, the early Christ, of early Christianity. He's rebuking them early, all right? So I wrote, the question is, what does it mean to the Lord? What does communion mean to the Lord? And I think that's a question that we should ask over everything, everything, prayer. What does that mean to the Lord? Finding out his heart, finding out his view, finding out, you know, we say, well, Lord, I'm going to take your view, but we never really delve into what's your view 
uh, in contrast to mine. I was thinking the other day about the scripture that says, <clears throat> um, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And um, I was thinking about how he, you know, how that scripture actually reads. And we go, well, okay, well, yeah, he's God and I'm man. So, you know, but he would say, um, you know, if I reached out my hand to put myself first, he'd say, that's not my way. That's not even how I think. That's how you think. And, you know, to, to, to pursue that, not just, not just say, not just assume the scripture is correct because it's in the scripture. His ways are not my ways and his thoughts are not my thoughts. So, so okay, you know, uh, and just put that on a God, man, human person basis instead of, well, help, you know, give me the contrast. You know, a lot of times to learn the Lord, there has to be a contrast. And the contrast is never easy because it makes us look bad compared to Jesus, <laughs> you know, which is okay. Because our goal isn't just the contrast of seeing that my mind is thinking something completely different from his. That, that, is, that can hurt or that can mess with us. But it is to take that and say, now, Holy Spirit, instead of me being condemned, open my eyes to his heart. And help me to see what his heart really is. Because his ways are not our ways either. See, I mean, his thoughts are not, you know. But his ways are not our ways. I would never do it that way. And you go, well, it never occurred to me because I assume that this is the right way. But he is the way. But see, we can say that and we know that. But the way we perceive, the way we think, the way that we make our way a lot of times is not him. He's not the way in us. He is the doctrinal way. But it has no practical value in our life. <clears throat> so, um, when we partake, we are to be with him where he is, uh, where he is in the matter. The ordinance is based upon his principles, his symbols, but really his heart and not ours. To be in communion is to have his mind, which is to see things as he sees. And I was reminded of the scripture that says, in thy light, we shall have light. Remember, anybody remember that scripture? But it's, you know, we're, trying, we're seeking light instead of in thy light. In the light of Jesus, I comprehend this, not just light from Jesus, okay? Um, and then the last sentence on that, it must involve two that have come to one mind. And guess what that results with? Oneness. When, when you begin to function by his mind, you're actually, now oneness is more than a doctrine. Amen? I mean, how valuable is that? Okay, how, okay let's, use, let's practice what we just read earlier. How valuable is that to him? that we come to that place, that we come to that place. <clears throat> All right, so, um, so let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We want to begin to look at some of the scriptures that relate to communion. First Corinthians 11. And we're going to look at verse uh, 17 first. <clears throat> and the context here is communion. And Paul says this, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. <clears throat> ah, that would be disturbing. That every time we have communion, it was actually for the worse. It wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't for the better, and it wasn't just, an okay service. It was actually for the worse. That would be disturbing. Okay. Well, Paul will get into why that that's an issue. And then verse 20 also says, when you come together, therefore, into one place, um, the actual, I think, Greek 
way it flows here is, is this not to eat the Lord's Supper? When we come together, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? Is it not to come to the Lord's table? Um, when the priests ate the bread in the, commun in, uh, the uh, holy place, was it not to come to communion to the heart of the Lord? And was not the true meaning of that to partake of him in, a, in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory, and not just um, the doctrine of Christ in us, the hope of glory, but Christ hardly show up except for in incredible ways of teaching that can just blow everyone else away, but little evidence of the very life of, of the lamb, the bread. Um, so, um, all right, so what I want to talk about next, uh, and the reason why I read those first two scriptures is to show that there are, there are problems at the table. There are problems at the table. And it's, the, if you know the scriptures, and I'm not going to get too much into all of that, but if you know the scriptures, um, you know that there were, a lot of people had a lot of different ideas in the middle of communion. Well, some are eating and some are doing this and some, you know. And um, there was no reverence for the very th thing that it existed for. Um, So, um, so I want to move on now, and I want to move to the area that, um, how much are we at? I can't even remember. Thank you. Okay. I want to move to an area that we may have to uh, divide here. Um, and it's called, I, I labeled it escape or self-giving. Escape or self-giving? All right, now I want you to think about this for a second. What I am going, I'm about to do is to contrast the Passover with the Lord's table. And my plan is to show that most people's understanding of the Lord's table or the Lord's supper is more Passover than it is the Lord's table. Okay. All right, so let's turn to Luke 22 and verse 19. <clears throat> and while we're reading this, I want you to try to pay close attention to the actual wording, now we all know this because we have communion regularly around here and we all know the scriptures here. I'm going to ask you not to read what you always read. I'm going to ask you to look to see if there is actually something else being said than what maybe we have put the emphasis upon. All right, we're going to start at verse 19 and read 19 through 22. This is speaking of Jesus. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it. Okay, so he took bread, which we already know, we're already privy to this before he gets to it. This represents his body. And he takes it and he gives thanks with what he's about to do. And he takes it and he breaks it. And then he gives it to them and tells them to eat it. Okay. All right. So let's look. Let's read it then. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Okay. So in a very real sense, you could say that he's talking to the family, not sinners. He's talking to those that are his. This is my body. I'm giving this to you. I want you to partake of my breaking. 
Okay. <clears throat> this do in remembrance of me. Okay, so I guess the question that comes up right now is what is it we're remembering? Seriously. I mean, we haven't really got into the meat of what I'm trying to say yet. I mean, but it's here. If, you, if, you have, if the Spirit of God is moving, what is it we're remembering? Because we may be missing, again, his explanations all along and seeing something that we've been taught and, or something that is important to us or something like that. All right, so likewise, this verse 20, likewise also the cup after um, uh, supper saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Okay, so this is what is shed for you. This is, this is what's poured out for you. And he says, this is, how's the word like result to this is, this is the cup in the new testament or the new covenant. The new covenant, the new covenant. Okay, but do we comprehend what he means when he's talking about that? <clears throat> um, verse 21, but, but, so this is going to help signal something here. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. Okay, so he's talking about, he's talking about giving himself and knowing absolutely that this guy right here is going to do it. And he's breaking it and blessing it. And he, there's something going on in him that is eternal. Okay? And then uh, verse 22, And truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. All right. So um, since our time is basically up here, let me say this. Um, clearly... While he's talking, he is not only mindful, but he's doing it even in the midst of his betrayal. And, true, and he says, and truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. That's the cross. That's the cross. Um, but yes, woe unto the person that brings that about because they're their motive. I mean, the Father sent Jesus to the cross for us, right? Amen? Well, then it wasn't wrong with the Father. He who spared not his own son, but freely gave him up for us all. His motive was in giving his son that we might have life. Judas's motive was to destroy something he didn't understand. All right, so we're going to look at the new, next we're going to get into the New Testament epistles and we're going to read some and we're going to build on this and then we're going to get into some real explanations in relationship to, to all this. So let's take about a five minute break and uh, we'll come back. So if anybody needs to go to the restroom or we have a... Uh